Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about processor trace today, um, part of uh, um, our family of efficient solutions for SOC designs. Um, in the conversation, in the talk today, we're going to talk a little bit about why processor trace matters. Um, review shortly some of the uh, RISC V trace uh, specification group activities. Um, talk about cycle accurate tracing with um, retirement delta trace. Um, before moving on to describing briefly some of the test and embedded analytics um, um, monitoring solutions and um, getting into a little bit of details of the embedded analytics um, trace encoder. So, uh, wh why, why does um, trace matter? Well, trace matters because um, we really believe it's all about the system it's not about just an ISA or performance of a specific core. Um, with modern SOCs having multiple cores, um, it is really crucial for the firmware developers and people developing the system overall to understand uh, the system behavior, and it's not an easy task. Um, surprisingly, uh, uh, saying somewhat sarcastically, software sometimes doesn't behave quite the way we expect it to do. Uh, software developers tend to spend between 50 and 75% of the time debugging the software. Um, and with increasing number of cores, uh, uh, more um, interactions between them, uh, we expect that this uh, uh, percentage of time will only increase. Um, the requirement for real-time performance, safety and security uh, um, is increasing, um, which uh, is increasingly important, which makes this debug uh, um, case even harder. Um, Providing non-intrusive uh, um, visibility is crucial because once you start to instrument your code, um, adding printfs or, or doing all kinds of things like that, uh, uh, the behavior of the system changes and then you get what we refer to as Heisenbugs, um, which really makes it really hard to uh, solve the, the, the problem. Um, processor branch trace alone often is not enough and it is crucial to be able to understand the uh, CPU stalling behavior. Um, just briefly describing the, the activities within the RISC-V International E-Trace or Efficient Trace Group. Um, the, the initial uh, processor trace specification had been released, uh, ratified in early 2020. Um, an extension to the standard is going through ratification right now. Um, the main differences, other than uh, minor fixes, the, the main differences from the original uh, um, 2020 uh, release is that the current release includes uh, a data trace and provides a, a very an end-to-end -end reference flow for people uh, developing um, systems. Um, so I mentioned earlier uh, one of the, the important um, aspects of, of trace is to be able to get uh, not just the instruction trace itself but to get a cycle accurate representation a report of, of the trace um, of, of the program. So what, what, what is it that we're trying to actually achieve in, in um, uh, cycle accurate trace? So the objective is to determine uh, uh, the time of when each instruction in your code retires. And equally importantly is to understand when and for how long the CPU stalled and, um, and did not retire in instructions. And that can give a lot of insight into uh, the behavior of the system. Um, so for the purpose of cycle accurate trace, um, the, the, the technique that uh, is being deployed is to report a number of clock cycles between each successive retirement. So instruction A retired at clock zero, instruction B retired one clock later, another clock later, and maybe then we had a, a stall for five clocks and, and so on. It is also advantageous in terms of reporting efficiency to report the number of back-to-back -back retirements without stall between them because then we can amortize the reporting of, of this group of instructions into a smaller um, trace uh, um, packet. And, and um, we, we do hope, of course, that because modern CPUs can retire uh, uh, um, an instruction every, every clock cycle, hopefully more often than not, uh, uh, this gives a lot of um, uh, opportunity for compressing the, the amount of information that's being sent out in part of this trace report. Um, then it's equally important to be able to uh, convey this information in, in an efficient manner. Um, and, and the approach that we, we're taking is that the basic reporting unit 
or, or group of units that are being reported are pairs of numbers. Uh, uh, one number describes how many instructions uh, uh, retired uh, um, contiguously and, and followed by the number of cycles that followed. Um, in, in the cases where CPUs support multiple retirements uh, uh, for superscalar designs, we also need to report how many instructions retire every clock cycle because obviously depending on, on the instruction mix, um, you may not be able to retire four instructions in a four-way four uh, uh, machine, uh, not be able to report that many, uh, uh, retire, excuse me, uh, this number of instructions. So now we need to talk a little bit about um, how to encode the, this um, cycle accurate uh, retirement, the, those two pairs of numbers. And, and obviously the, the naive approach would be to just say, okay, here's a number, here's a number, two numbers, send them out as integers or, or, or an 8-bit number or whatever is needed, but uh, that's not going to be very efficient. Um, so we investigate a number of different encoding uh, uh, formats and um, uh, um, zeroed in on two, two encoding formats, the Elias Gamma and Elias Delta. Um, the Elias Delta format provides uh, uh, the most efficient uh, um, encoding, but um, under um, f for values less, or less than 32, which we, we thought were the, the, the common case, uh, Elias Gamma has the same or even better efficiency than that. Um, so the way we, the, the reason for, for, for choosing to focus on, on the kind of lower end of the, of the number range is that um, uh, um, those large numbers are not going to be very frequent, uh, unfortunately maybe, uh, but the coding efficiency for those numbers is becoming less, is, is less important. Um, the, the amortization of short stalls uh, are below some threshold um, will also yield in, in improved efficiency because we, rather than report uh, um, individual numbers, we end up reporting uh, um, on, on an, an overall number that, that um, um, just, again, uh, improves the, the reporting efficiency. Um, we represent the, those numbers into uh, uh, different types of uh, um, count tokens. There are five types of them, and those uh, tokens are assembled into to three group formats, and this helps, allows us to ensure that um, the, the, pack, the, the packaging, the pick, packing efficiency is, is increased and um, it helps reduce the um, amount of data that be, needs to be sent from the encoder IP through the trace infrastructure the, uh, um, off chip. Um, at at Test and Embedded Analytics, we enable powerful SOC analysis uh, uh, using Silicon IP software libraries and tools to create a flexible data platform. Uh, for system level visibility um, into the complexity of your SOC. So if you look at this slide in here, all those blue blocks down at the bottom are uh, your, your design and the embedded analytics um, platform shown in green in here has uh, um, three, three parts to it. There is some silicon IP that is in integrated into the design. Um, we'll see one of those IPs in, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Um, some software interfaces and uh, different software tools, uh, um, IDEs, ver various APIs, uh, um, database interfaces, embedded SDK, um, all providing an interface to an application layer, um, uh, application that you as a customer can uh, um, you write to interact with the system and extract different kinds of information from it. And here, here we integrated the IP into, into the SOC. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to just move quickly to describing the, um, our um, trace encoder, the uh, efficient trace encoder. Um, so th this is a, um, a system contextual um, depiction of what, what um, um, a system might look like. So here, here's your favorite RISC-V core. Um, it, it, We'll have a debug module interface, uh, which um, will will let the debugger um, interact with the core, put it in, in you know insert breakpoints, put uh, single stepping, and, and etc. And it will have a, a, a data trace and instruction trace ports that are complying with with, with the RISC V workgroup specification. Um, the trace encoder in here will be configured using um, 
either an external debugger or using some on-chip resources um, through through the um, infrastructure that, that our uh, tools provide. And um, we'll then um, s consume the trace information that is coming from the core, create the trace packets based on the uh, um, algorithms specified in the RISC-V uh, specification work uh, uh, document, and the, sorry, the RISC-V processor trace specification, and, and um, transport that off chip into um, um, a, a debugger um, for further analysis to, to create uh, um, the, the depiction of the instruction stream. So what's inside, what, what is inside um, our, our uh, trace encoder? Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, um, our trace encoder fully supports the efficient trace or e-trace e uh, work group specification, um, starting with the heart encoder interface, which is uh, um, that section over here, um, creating an efficient instruction trace encoding over here and enabling the data trace. Additional features that we have in our implementation of the trace encoder, which are above this, the, the specifications in, in the standard, are um, the cycle accurate um, instruction trace uh, capabilities that I mentioned earlier. Um, programmable filters over here um, to allow allow you to focus just on the area of the code that you care about, therefore reducing the amount of trace that needs to be carried off chip, reducing the amount of data that you need to look through uh, uh, when you're analyzing your um, software. Um, there is a very flexible and extensive cross-triggering mechanism between the embedded trace um, encoder, the, the efficient trace encoder and other um, embedded analytics IPs, uh, and this, this cross-trigger um, allows for um, various um, scenarios to, for example, decide to start trace when you s detect a particular event happening in somewhere in the system, or maybe when, you, when uh, in, in a multi-core system, maybe you want to start trace of core zero when, when uh, uh, a trace event is happening on a different core. So all this um, uh, cross-trigging is going to help you achieve that in, in a very uh, efficient way. Um, some, some of the advanced features uh, uh, um, that have been introduced, I believe, in the latest um, Efficient Trace uh, specification um, are um, geared towards improving the efficiency of the trace stream coming off of the encoder. Uh, we support all of those. So we'll start with the first one over here. Um, we, we, we know that probably the, lar the single largest source of indirect jumps in, in code are, are function returns. Um, the, the problem with function returns from a trace point of view is that there are, um, um, well, well there's, there's a lot of them, but, but we want to be able to report them as efficiently as, as possible. So those are almost inferable because if there were, if there were function calls, um, if, we, if we maintain the stack of, of the function calls, um, all we need to do when we see a function return is look up in some internal uh, uh, structures that we maintain, look up what the return address was. We will know that the trace, encode, the trace decoders, decoding software will be implementing the same algorithm. So then rather than having to report the full 32 or, or 40 or whatever bit address uh, for the return, we just need to indicate, you know, we returned uh, um, to the entry, to the address that was in entry number three in, in our return stack. Um, so we implement a stack of return addresses in, in the encoder, um, and we only report the actual return address, um, oh, oh, sorry, we only report the actual return address if, if it was different from what we had in, in, the, um, in, in, in the return um, stack. Uh, the next, the next um, um, efficiency improvement is around branches. So the, the name branch prediction in here might be a little bit confusing. We're not talking about the branch prediction mechanism that the uh, um, instruction fetch unit maybe employs, but, but rather is, is a mechanism for the encoder hardware and the decoder software to agree on how branches are being reported. So the normal uh, um, mechanism for doing uh, reporting of branches is, is using a branch map. So for every branch in the code, 
we need one, one bit to say whether the ransom was taken or not taken, and that way we can reconstruct the instruction stream. However, if you're sitting in a tight loop um, and, and uh, um, doing, I don't know, say 200 iterations in there, that's going to imply that you're going to have to send 200 bits that will all say the same thing, right? So, so with that, we say, okay, well, rather than, rather than waste all those bits, let, let's have a little branch prediction mechanism implemented in the trace encoder also instrumental in the trace decoder, that basically we, we track the, those branches. And if we see that those branches, uh, um, if, if, if they meet the prediction, then all we need to do is we need to count how many times we did, uh, um, um, uh, how, how many times the prediction was correct, and, and just report that number. And when the prediction was not correct, then uh, uh, we need to report differently. So. It, it helps improve the uh, coding efficiency across the trace interface. Um, the, the last one in here that I wanted to talk about is the jump, uh, the jump target cache. Um, and this is where, if we have loops that uh, contain uninferable jumps, uh, uninferable jumps are really difficult from a uh, um, trace efficiency point of view because an uninferable jump means that we need to report the target address in its entirety. We cannot infer it from uh, um, fr from the, from the uh, uh, source code. Um, so, w when there isn't a loop with unfurled jumps, um, we will need to report the same uh, target address multiple times, right? If we, if we iterate 100 times, every time we're going to have to report the same address, and it's going to get really boring and obviously not, not efficient. So, the way to work around that is to have a little cache um, of, of um, the, the jump addresses, and then if we see an uninferable jump that was matching the content of the cache, we we'll just report, hey, my cache entry number one, this is what had happened now. Um, if, if, we, if, if the actual target address was not the same as what was in, in the cache, then we obviously need to report the full, uh, um, the, the full address. So I'd like to finish by uh, just kind of recapping a little bit. Uh, um, systems are, today's systems, and we're all building fairly complex systems, uh, and they are hard to understand, period, and they're hard to understand if we're not using the right tools for that. Um, the systems must do what they're designed to do safely and securely, and um, one dimension of that is, is understanding where CPUs uh, are stall, the encoder, a trace encoder with cycle accurate mode provides this information um, with, all, uh, with, with um, a number of um, encoding efficiency features uh, implemented in that. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time today. And if you have any questions, please uh, uh, stop by and ask. Thank you very much.